Hey, Dave. Are you on the other end of that blank screen?
All right, welcome everybody. My name is Brian Sohn. I'm a professor at Carson Newman University, and this is the Knoxville Area Teach-In for Climate Justice. I'm excited about the program that we've got set up for today. Um, and we'll begin with a video that has come from Bard College in New York, which is the primary organizer of this worldwide event. Thumbs up if y'all can see the blank YouTube screen. Awesome, thank you. Welcome to the worldwide teach-in on climate and justice. Bienvenue à la conférence mondiale éducative sur le climat et la justice. Bem-vindo ao encontro participativo global sobre clima e justiça. Today, we are coming together globally to share our concern for the climate crisis, for climate justice, and to find solutions. We understand that carbon pollution is causing the planet to heat up. We see the fires and floods, the droughts, the crop failures. This teaching will help us all move from despair about this to determination together to change the future. Why climate injustice? Global warming is profoundly unjust. People in low-income communities are already suffering the most as the planet heats up. In the last year, tens of millions of people have been forced to leave their homes by climate change. More refugees than from conflict and violence combined. We can stop this. We can stabilize the climate and in doing so, create jobs and opportunities for all in a new green economy. What will it take? Our hard work and the courage to face it. It's not. <clears throat> All right, so I'm pausing the video here because what we had is a, a montage of doom. And uh, I think that we don't need any more uh, doom montages um, at this time. Um, I, ha I read this book and one of the ideas was like, we know that a bus is going to hit a child that's in the street, we just go save the child. We don't calculate the braking distance or the velocity of the van. So um, I'm skipping this part and jumping ahead to where we start talking about what to do here. I can be courageous. I can use my voice and passion, keep fighting even on the days it feels hopeless. I can fight I can hold on to the movies and have. I can save our land against this climate. I can be a voice for the sky, the soil, and the sea. I can make a good future for our next generation. I can stand up, even when it feels easier to stand up. I can love my brothers and sisters and protect their lives. If we have the same mother, the great mother of I can be louder than polluters that try to silence life. I can divide the heart and lead others around me to do better. I can ask my teachers to make climate a class. Make climate a class. Make climate a class. All right, so welcome. I'm going to hand it over to Tyranny Bradley, the youth Cherokee activist who's going to do uh, continue our welcome. Okay, um, can everybody hear me? <laughs> okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> so as Dr. Sun said, my name is Tierney Bradley. Um, I am part of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Um, so I'll be doing the land acknowledgement. Uh, so Shio, I ask you all to join me in acknowledging the traditional homelands of uh, the Cherokee and the Yuchu people that Carson Newman University and surrounding areas sits on. Uh, today we honor and acknowledge those past and present who have kept the land sacred. And we recognize the importance of the land and the responsibility we all share to become better stewards of the land. Shiki. Awesome, thank you. Tierney. Okay, um, at this point, I'm gonna introduce my sister, who's the former director of sustainability for Bonnaroo, 
Um, Laura held that role for many years. And uh, Bonnaroo during that time won awards for being the Greenest Festival. And uh, I'm proud of the work that she's done. And uh, she's gonna tell you a little bit more about that work. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, so I worked at Bonnaroo for 13 years. And for 11 of those, I was the director of sustainability. Um, so that role encompassed both the operational work and then um, often as things happen with these uh, things that didn't quite fit, but then ended up fitting, got thrown in as well. And that was um, managing um, what we call Planet Rue, which was basically a non a nonprofit village, traditional nonprofit village when I took over it, but not quite so by the end. Um, so of course, when I started working at this giant festival, which was on 700 acres um, in middle Tennessee and had 80,000 attendees, um, my focus was definitely on operational issues. Um, we worked hard to create an on-site composting facility so that all the compostable materials that um, we brought onto site, stayed on site. We used that throughout the land to help restore post-festival. Um, we installed a solar power array. We were the first um, major festival in the United States to have solar. Um, and we worked you know, on supply chain, all the things you might expect um, when you think of traditional sort of management of an event um, and ways to make it more sustainable. So all of these things were back of house is what we would call it. So they weren't fan facing except for when we told them about it um, and telling people things is effective up to a point, but it doesn't really, um, doesn't always have an impact long-term. Um, so at a certain point, um, I realized that while these operational things were important, there was a threshold that we could reach because we were still gonna have a festival. So the best, I would often joke with reporters, um, you know, the best thing that we could do would be to not have the festival, but that wasn't really, an, I mean, it wasn't an option. Of course it's an option, but it wasn't really an option because, you know, it was happening. Um, so that's led to, with me, a little bit of a personal um, crisis about my work because, you know, the operational work to reduce carbon footprint was necessary, um, but it wasn't actually working towards equitable solutions for climate change or beyond our personal, the festival's personal carbon footprint. Um, so this got me thinking about um, different aspects of our work, what I had access to, the tools, and um, and uh, and actually like pretty big platform that I didn't that we didn't really fully grasp um, until I had this sort of personal crisis. So I realized that what uh, one way we could work towards educating people about equitable solutions would be to start framing our work. And, and this led to more of a focus on Planet Rue than operational work, but start framing our work with this concept of healthy communities. And you can't, we're never gonna solve any climate change problems if we don't have equity and access to healthy communities. Um, so I started to try to shift our front of house presentations towards um, inclusiveness, equity, and representation. Um, so for me, and the ethos that began to inform our work was a personal definition of healthy community, which was access to, you know, people need to have access to safe housing, schools, water, and food. And it means access to healthcare and a feeling of safety and well being. So, Everyone needs to be able to exist within a healthy community uh, free of racism, sexism, and, dis and discrimination. So 
as a result, I shifted and sort of reframed um, the nonprofits that were in Planet Rue. So um, previously, the majority of them, we had a strong relationship with a voting access group called Headcount, and then the rest of them were sort of more um, environmental groups, which we kept a large number of those, but also started to incorporate other groups. Um, so some of the work that we did once we once I made the shift towards um, kind of recurating Planet Rue was um, we worked with a group called Eat for Equity and created Bonnaroo's Dinner, which was locally sourced sit down five course meal in the middle of the festival for 120 people each night. Um, and we integrated all the other nonprofits into that dinner by having them host tables and speak to the, they were able to have more one-on-one -on -one conversations with patrons. Um, we worked with Calling All Crows to implement a campaign around the festival grounds about sexual harassment. And by the time we left, we were able to add a sexual assault counselor at the festival medical tent. And we were also doing bystander training um, for all of our security staff, which is about 5,000 people and uh, volunteers, and then any other staff that wanted to go to the bystander training. Um, the, one of the pieces I was most happy we were able to tackle is that we had a survivor activist from the Parkland school shooting who spoke multiple years to advocate for smart gun control. Um, and then the other big piece um, that did tack on to the sort of logistics of or more operational parts of climate change as I look at them is that we did work, um, partner with a group, We Are Neutral, and we worked with all the low income, all the regional low income housing units to weatherize them. So we reduced their energy bills and we didn't, um, officially certify those as festival offsets um, because it was an administrative, an administrative process that I didn't really feel was worth it because we were doing the work. Um, but those in turn did unofficially count as um, carbon offsets for the festival. So there's a lot of other work that these incredible nonprofits that we partnered with um, did. Um, but suffice to say, it was a multi-year process of integrating the kind of obvious things you expect a festival to do, which we did very well. Um, and I'm very proud of all the groups that did it, but I am most proud of the shift we made towards um, equating social justice with, also, with climate justice. Um, so, Ultimately, this did look like a shift away from hard uh, environmental work. But, um, you know, as, as Brian and I talk about a lot in our free time, if you don't have access to voting, you can't vote on policies for climate change. If you don't feel safe in your space because you've been sexually assaulted, you're not going to necessarily use your voice to advocate for social justice or climate change. Um, and if kids don't feel safe at school, we all know the pro like it, these problems compound upon each other. Some of them are institutionalized and some of them aren't, but we had an opportunity with the, such a big platform at Bonnaroo to tackle some of these other sort of more indirectly related um, issues. And I felt, like we did, um, by the time I left, we did start to make a, a really nice shift towards um, substantial, substantially addressing those issues. Um, and sort of not related, but I was very, we, every year I would send out an annual report to the fans so that they could see exactly what we were doing. And it was, um, I think, pretty full transparency for an organization like Bonnaroo. Um, instead of just um, greenwashing everything. So um, just to wrap up, you know, I think if we, we all know climate change is the major issue of our time. Um, I think 
outside of um, making large corporations change their behaviors, that we as individuals focus on the humanity of the issue, that we're more likely to come up with equity equitable and compassionate solutions, which if we leave large groups behind when we're talking about these problems and um, um, issues, then we're, you, we won't effectively um, solve the problem. Um, so embracing the ethos of a healthy community at the festival was the way I was able to do it with the tools I had access to at the time. And um, I think we did move the needle a bit in reaching um, some different groups of people that might not be as easily reached. Awesome, yeah, thanks, Laura. It's great to hear that again. <clears throat> be reminded of the great work that you did. Uh, we're gonna open up. We've got uh, about 10 minutes for questions and um, responses. Hey, thanks for that great uh, overview of uh, Bonnaroo's sustainability efforts. Uh, I'm Thomas Frazier, I'm with Hellbender Press, but this is just me as a citizen of Earth. Uh, you mentioned a, a catered dinner that was at Bonnaroo that featured like farm to table stuff and <laughs> sounds like an amazing um, catering feat, but how, how was that? To whom was that available? So it was um, that the 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 chef or caterer was actually the executive director of Eat for Equity, and it was available to everyone. And if you couldn't afford the ticket price, you could barter or volunteer at the dinner for a seat at the table. So we held back. Um, oh, and also, all of the ticket sale money was. Um, given directly to Eat for Equity as a donation. So the festival, it turned out to be an incredible PR piece for the festival, which you, you kind of knew would happen, but also it was truly like, everything was lo actually locally sourced. The chef was also the ED of Eat for Equity. And if you couldn't afford the ticket price, people could volunteer or barter um, to have a seat at the table. But was it was there like some sort of lottery system for it or it was available like when you bought your ticket when you bought your ticket you could add on the dinner and they sold out usually within about an hour to, of general <laughs> tickets going on sale okay. but we always held back a percentage of those seats like i said for volunteers um and um at the festival people would come to the booth and if they were doing the barter situation they would just go to Eat for Equity's booth in Planet Room and talk to them about it. And Eat for Equity is an incredible group based in Minneapolis. They did um, a lot of free meals for people during the George Floyd act shooting and uh, protests that followed. They were right near their, uh, um, I'm sorry, office and kitchen. It was right in the neighborhood where it happened and they offered free meals for protesters and stuff. So it was pretty, they're pretty impactful. Um, local Minneapolis organization that Bonnery was able to give a more national platform to. Nice, very nice. So if, if there are no other questions right now, uh, what was the menu uh, on a typical night? Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> I have all the recipes available if anyone wants them, but um, we worked with Benton's Bacon, Cruz Farm, and the banana cream pie is the best pie I've ever had in my life. Um, we also worked with um, Anson Mills, which isn't quite as local, but they're an heirloom grain, and um, they brought back indigenous uh, beans from the Charleston region with the, uh, uh, so indigenous beans and grains that they've like, so sea island peas and grits, and it was a very amazing menu. The food was great. Well, so they even had a, a gala angle there huh? Mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> very good thank you yeah thank you i have a question and i'm not sure how to ask it laura but thank you for your presentation and um it's just eye-opening to see uh someone in your position with a huge festival 
making um, sustainability and care for the earth and for the earth's people part of your mission. I, I would never have put those two things together. Um, but you said, you know, you felt like you had a pretty significant impact on a lot of, uh, on a lot of levels, uh, but certainly mm -hmm. not corporate, not big corporations. And, and I just wondered if through your work, um, you have had some ideas about influencing uh, more powerful entities uh, toward sustainability and care for one another in the earth. I mean, definitely. And I think that um, a lot of corporations um, and even like some MBA teams with their community foundations are starting to hire social impact coordinators. And I do think that that was the secondary sort of subtitle of my position once I started embracing this healthy community ethos. Um, but I think that some of these things are very obvious and simple that corporations could start doing to acknowledge the land they're on, partner with local groups doing um, um, activism things. And I think um, just off the top of my head to answer this, I think kind of ironically, or I don't know if that's the right word, but the um, ACLU is kind of an example, I feel like, of what corporations could do where the ACLU is an umbrella foundation that does a lot of legal work, but they also, to do their community organizing, they partner with local community groups to actually do community organizing. The ACLU doesn't really do it. So I feel like there would be a way to adapt that model for corporations to you know, find strong community partners that they align with and let the community group do the work, um, but to fund it. There, there, there are people doing the work everywhere. There's not a lot of need to reinvent the wheels. And that's what we did at Bonnaroo. Like I, I'm, I was like a manager of things and a curator. I didn't come up, I came up with some of the ideas, but not all the ideas, and obviously, some of the best ideas came from our nonprofits. The, um, the NRDC had one the last year I worked there that was like so awesome. They, they set up almost like an old school um, telethon in their booth with iPhones and stuff so that patrons could come into the booth and on the spot call their senators or House of Representatives reps to advocate for a specific bill. So I think all that to say, um, I just think partnering with strong groups that are already doing the work is um, right. is just important, and it's it's very easy, actually. You just have to give them the money to execute the work and make sure they do. It's very easy. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hey, Laura, I got one question maybe you can, mm. I'll try to do a quick answer in the chat but what's greenwashing oh it's when companies it's like it's when companies say we're we're uh, doing we're recycle or we're 100 percent uh waste free when they're not it's <laughs> it's just like using these concepts for publicity versus um actually doing the work um so yeah Awesome. Uh, so it's two fifty five. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna transition uh, to our next speaker. Thanks again, Laura. Um, Thank that's you. great. And uh, Cy Keener has has uh, sent a video, and I'm gonna show that um, now. And Cy's joined in the call, and then we'll do the same kind of thing: responses and question and answer with Cy. So. Here we go. Share the screen with video. Did y'all see the black screen? Thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Here we go. Yes. Hello. Uh, thanks so much to Brian for having me. My name is Cy Keener. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland. And I teach in the art department uh, where I teach. Uh, mix of sculpture and 
coding and electronics. So I'm just sharing a little bit about my research here. Uh, this is documentation from last year. So uh, what you just saw there was us flying in a helicopter uh, about 400 feet above the ocean, north of the northernmost point in Alaska. So here we've actually landed the helicopter on the ice. So this is sea ice, which I'll talk about in a little bit um, later. And then what you just saw there is someone drilling through the ice. So the helicopter is actually sitting on about five feet of ice. And then we just were able to drill through that um, and are now placing a sensor that goes down through the whole thickness of the ice. So this is our team here. We're doing a mix of these scientific instruments and then also some art instruments. So what you just saw me do there is put the sensor down through that hole. Um, and then that sensor has a red, green, blue light sensor. So kind of like a colored sensor on one side and then it has a temperature sensor on the other side. These are some kind of close up <clears throat> images of another, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, putting that sensor in through the ice. So again, this, this green side has these little tiny things that are kind of like in your camera or your phone that would take um, color readings of the ice. And then this is a, a drawing that's made with code that outputs the, um, the colors of the ice and then also the temperatures and the actual color numbers. So uh, what I do is I feed that drawing into another set of electronics that displays it with LEDs. So there is me standing next to a light sculpture and then that sculpture is actually recreating the light in the ice. So um, there are there is an area up above uh, at the kind of top of the sculpture where there's air or it's just a white light. And then there's an area that's kind of in the middle, um, almost like the middle two thirds of the sculpture that is the color from the ice um, at midday. And then this is the bottom of the sculpture where I have a little bit of flicker kind of animating um, the fact that it's the ocean. So again, here you've got that top, maybe 20% is white and then that greenish color in the middle, kind of two thirds is the, the ice sitting on the ocean. And then that last kind of bottom, maybe 25% is, um, is the ocean. So this is um, one of the things that I do as an artist. Uh, so I actually, I collaborate with scientists and I get to go out on the Arctic Ocean and um, deploy these instruments. And then the instruments are uh, contributing to a weather and climate data sets that scientists use. And then the, I also use it to do what they call, um, we kind of call like messaging or, or broader impacts. Um, and then this is just a little brief um, video about why you should care about the Arctic Ocean and what you should know about sea ice. So um, this is the animation that NOAA has put together and I think it starts in the 80s at some point. And then this white, um, yeah, I guess it starts in, in around 1990. And so then this white ice is the kind of thick ice. So um, there's this connection between older ice being thicker and then the thicker the ice, then the more kind of protective cap it has on the, the top of the, the globe um, or the top of our planet. And then the cap can reflect um, sunlight. So for the past, you know, 30 to 40,000 years, this um, fairly thick, um, this fairly thick covering of ice uh, has wow. sat on the top of our globe and then it has now just sort of in my lifetime um, disappeared. So uh, there's still ice up there in the winter, but it's just much thinner. So you'll kind of see it as we get um, there on the, this kind of final comparison on the right, we've got the 2016 um, and then on the left, we've got that, I think it's the 1990 data set. So, um, so basically, and then the blue is, is just the kind of full extent. So um, I, think, I think that this was just a, a, something that I saw when I first started to get into the Arctic um, Ocean and kind of understand what was going on there. And I think that the big kind of profound thing for me, uh, just as a, as a person that cares about our future here on the planet and, um, and the kind of viability of, of our existence, I think that the, the big thing that was kind of surprising to me was just the fact that this all sort of took place during my lifetime, that there was not, it's not something that's going to happen in the future, but it's just something that has already taken place. Uh, 
Um, so I think I'm just going to cut the, the recording there, and I'm happy to just kind of chat with folks and take questions at this point. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Sai. Do you want to test your mic real quick before you take questions? Yeah, I'm here, Brian. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. All right. Who, who's, uh, who's first on the questions there? So this is Beth, Ben Landingham. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm really um, interested in your work as an artist and wondered if you could talk about why you think art, uh, mix, mixing art with science is uh, a powerful tool for helping people move from uh, maybe ignorance to knowledge about the basic issues, but then maybe on to action. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. I mean, the <clears throat> just to be super blunt, I think that the science perspective is is one of seeking knowledge and trying to be sure about things, and that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of training that goes into kind of being cautious about our findings and and like scientists are basically com trained to communicate in ways that are are very um kind of measured and then i feel like that the the purpose of art if i was to like boil it all down i feel like the purpose of art is to to kind of um get people to have more of an embodied and an, an emotional experience and so i think that that in some ways science is just ill-equipped to um, communicate the urgency and the kind of breadth and depth of the situation. And I, and I don't think that art, it's not like art is the, the answer, <laughs> but I think that we as a culture need to come up with a bunch of different answers as to how to, to really understand the changes that are going on and, and to, um, to try to feel those changes. Like not just, I, I don't think that behavioral change, I don't think that kind of action comes out of, um, like rational decision making always <laughs> the action and and behavior kind of come out of this complex um, mix of all the things that we kind of think and feel and and so I guess I see my job as an artist to, to sort of take the things that are happening and kind of use the scientific tools in the same way that like an artist a painter uses a brush or a photographer uses a camera I'm kind of interested in taking like in this case the scientific sensors that they're using to measure the amount of light that's which their scientists are interested in for the amount of light in the sense of the amount of heat that's getting into the ocean but it, they are also the folks that i was collaborating with were also using these red green blue sensors to try to discern that spectrum and i, I just thought that there was a really beautiful analog there as far as like we can make we can make art from that <laughs> like mm -hmm. wouldn't it be amazing if we could also just stand next to this five feet of ice in the ocean and just kind of imagine what it's like to have five feet of ice over an ocean and what it's like to, to sort of stand on top of that or to to see it in an like in an embodied sense. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, go for I it. Wanted, I just wanted to know how you 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 pulled a lot of very kind of seemingly different fields of your technology experience and artistic experience into this relatively unknown scientific strategy. How did you come up to that connection? Yeah, I think it's just over time. I've, I've been pretty lucky to, to try to seek out opportunities to kind of keep expanding my skill set and keep learning new things. And um, I learned electronics and code in a, in an art school setting. So I, I now teach in an art school and I teach those things, but I also learned them um, in an art school setting. And um, a lot of this stuff is more accessible now. So I think if I was trying to do this work 20 years ago, I'd have to have an engineering degree, but a lot of these things have gotten more accessible. And then, um, and then I think that the, the scientific collaborations have just been really those are things that I kind of can't, I can seek out, but I can't really control um, that it, I can't, I can't just sort of force those, but I've been really lucky that people have been enthusiastic about my, um, my work and that I'm now 
kind of on this team, like I'm actually trying to get to the airport <laughs> in the next few minutes um, to go out with the team and that they kind of treat me as just like an embedded um, person that's part of their team and, and actually have a National Science Foundation funding to kind of do that. But this is stuff that I've kind of put together over years and I've just been really lucky that I've been able to kind of keep um, you know, you only you learn one skill at a time. <laughs> You're just kind of lucky if you can keep going and keep learning more skills. Hey, really quick, I know you got to get to the airport, but uh, what are some of the most striking reactions to your art you've experienced, and uh, what is your next project? Yeah, I think it's hard to it's hard to measure your own art. <laughs> to like understand it in, in other people's ways and I don't, I don't I'm not trying to like mystify anything but I think um, you know I think what I'm looking for it's hard for me to say what other people have have kind of gotten from it but I guess what I'm looking for is just this idea of embodied experience that if I can stand next to something that's my size and I can experience whether it's like the wind or the waves or the the ice in a in a way that's kind of embodied then I think that that's the thing that I'm hoping for and I, the other small piece that I really try for is to I try to get situations where people can experience the the data in real time so that just means that like you're looking at the ice from that day I feel like it's you know when we look at charts and graphs that it's it's sort of this historic thing and it's kind of easy to disassociate and so I think that there's one of the cool things about technology is that it allows you to like make a connection. Like you're talking on the phone to someone, you know, we're all on the zoom call from all these different locations. And I think that if my art can do that, then that's really great. And then um, as far as projects, I think the, the cool project that I haven't made any art from that I got to do, but I got to go with the same group in August and I got to go tag icebergs in Greenland from a ship. And um, I haven't made any art with it yet, but I, I have a really amazing data set from that and just an amazing set of memories. Um, but we kind of tag the icebergs like people would tag a like bear or a lion or, <laughs> or something like that. But we were um, going around in this area of Western Greenland that has a lot of icebergs coming off of the um, one of the glaciers there. And we were able to put GPS trackers on it and then watch where they go by satellite tracking. And I was able to take a bunch of um, photos of them to create 3d models of them and and so that's a, another kind of fun project that i'm working on i look forward to seeing it thank you <laughs> thanks brian what's our time do you got to move on to the next guest or how are we doing uh no we've still got some time okay any other any other questions or thoughts well, I have another obvious question, which is, why should we care about the Arctic? <laughs> That's a great one. It's far away. Um, <laughs> it's far away. Um, the Earth is not warming evenly. And so the Arctic is, uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic are like the canary in the coal mine. So they're, they're the parts that the changes have already happened and, and they're much more perceptible. Um, and so... The way that I've been able to experience that is just by going, going there and then um, working with the the native people who live there, and just they they used to be able to judge what was going to happen with the ice by the calendar or by the kind of time of year, and then now it's just like a totally different thing where the the temperatures and the seasons are no longer really dependable or they're not really related to the calendar. Um, so I think that there's this we should care about it from this this place of it's where the most radical change is taking place um, and where we can kind of see this change taking place first and where the radical change has already taken place. And then I think that the, the, that kind of, that's a more emotive side, but then I think the conceptual side is that what I mentioned in that, in my little chat is that the, the top of the, it's a, it's a boring science thing, but just the, the, a white surface reflects a lot more heat <laughs> and the ocean is dark and the and the ice is white and it and so um the ice cap will reflect 90 percent of the sun's energy and the ocean will absorb about 70 percent of the sun's energy so um the more ice the you know for the last 30 or 40 thousand years we've we've had a big a bunch of white up there and that that's the, what the energy balance of the earth has been kind of dependent on and then for the last 30 years, we've just changed that um, pretty radically. So um, we are now just allowing 
um, kind of more, the, the la lack of ice just brings more heat into the ocean. So are indigenous people um, part of your work? How, how, how are they part of this? Yeah, so we, like today I'll, I will fly um, to Seattle. I'm in DC right now, I'll fly to Seattle and then tomorrow I'll make my way up to Utkiagvik, which is um, the northernmost point in the US. And then um, we actually work with and contract what they call a native corporation. And so in order to get permission just to go out on the ice, then we, um, then we like we stay in these lodgings that are kind of run by this um, Utkiagvik Science um, Corporation. So like they basically kind of um, enable access and control access, and then they also um, provide access in the sense that they go out there with us uh, with and kind of our, act as our guides and tell us where we can go and where we can't go. And they also bring um, rifles to protect us from polar bears and they keep us away from the polar bears and, and do all this kind of stuff. So there's, um, you kind of, the way that we access it is, in, is through, um, through their generosity. I mean, I think we, you know, we also pay or the National Science Foundation also pays, but it's sort of that, that that's, they're just part of the, the way that we access the ice. Thank you. I guess you've explained why you're drawn toward uh, the polar shots, because that's where the most profound, or rather the polar inspired art, sorry, because that's where the changes occurring are most profound. Have you contemplated or do you have plans to move to say, document uh, drought through art and science? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I think that I've just, the polar thing has been, or the, the access to the Arctic has been something that's, that's I've been able to do since 2019. And it's, it's kind of like, I've just fell into this group um, that's been really great. But I did, um, I did spend a ton of time in 2017 and 2018 uh, working on sea level rise. So I, I worked for a year on a sea level rise project that was um, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, a bunch of the San Francisco Bay Area governments to try to come up with design strategies. So that was, the, you know, the Arctic's amazing and I see myself as out there kind of trying to collect, you know, collect these like data kind of versions or facsimiles of different things that are out there that may not be out there in the future. But then we also need creative people working on, on solution type things. And so, you know, just we're, we're kind of locked into this sea level rise um, cycle right now. And so I, I think that, that that project was working with rivers and trying to come up with ways to kind of um, use nature to help try to combat sea level rise um, through, through river systems. So, um, so yeah, I think that I, it's just, uh, uh, as an artist, you kind of get to pick your projects and then you kind of fall into different things that um, this sort of cycle. So um, this is kind of my current cycle, but, um, but yeah, I hope to, to be able to engage in other, other aspects as well. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Brian, I, th I should probably cut out, but uh, I really appreciate you guys making time for me. Yeah, thanks for joining, Si. I hope you have a safe flight. Yeah, I'll keep listening, but I will be off camera. And um, and thanks a lot for doing all this, Brian. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right. Time. Thank you. All right. Okay, so on the agenda, I had, had time for a, a response panel, and so... Um, uh, Beth or any, any student activists, if you guys have a, a direct re response or you want to, an indirect response is welcome that too. Um, so go ahead. Well, I'd just like to say what a wonderfully um, produced uh, webinar this was. Thank you for doing it. I, I would like to say that um, it has been hopeful, Brian. I mean, to hear that uh, people from uh, multiple backgrounds, talents, and skills are approaching this global crisis in a way that speaks to others, um, that's got to be good because the more we, we reach and the more ways we have to reach them is very positive. I guess I would uh, comment on um, 
just what Sai, his work is showing us and uh, what Laura was talking about is that all these issues are interconnected. And so um, I think that's a new, you know, thinking about from a historical perspective, it's, it's a new consciousness that we have that all of these issues about indigenous rights and sea level rise are connected. Uh, the way we go about our everyday lives um, is connected to what happens to people in the Arctic. Um, I think the Arctic is the canary in the coal mine, but it also uh, is a really complex place that is because of climate change is now back into um, political play, if you will, um, because now a lot of the industrialized countries are looking at the Arctic as a a path for commerce and a place to start exploiting even further. So what seems like a, we might say a, a crisis for the indigenous people in their way of life um, looks like an opportunity to industrial, to the industrialized world. So um, I think it, we have to think big. We have to think in terms of complex patterns and understand the science, but also move past that with uh, action. And I think the artist and writers are, you know, critical in that, um, other musicians as well. So that's good. My, my thought as a historian, you know, it's a, it's a long battle. Other big battles have been fought in the past um, that we didn't think we could win and that we have made progress on. So um, like others, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can identify and understand the complexity of the problems and then keep working toward a solution. Yeah, it's kind of a classic uh, negative feedback loop, uh, what's going on in the Arctic. Uh, as the ice melts, it opens up more avenues for uh, energy extraction, petroleum extraction, <laughs> or gas extraction. So yeah, that's, that's an excellent point he, he pointed out with the, uh, the uh, comparative images between the Arctic and what was it, 1990 versus 2016, 2018. That, I've never seen that graphic before and that was pretty profound. And he pointed out that it's during the summertime, but I mean, that's when most commerce would have occur anyway. So yeah, negative feedback loop as is much of climate change. No, I think this has been a really great moment to get all these different activist groups together. And we have wide representation here. I think it's just, it really helps to show how we are all involved in this, no matter what activism you choose. It's all interlinked and we all have a job to play in kind of honestly saving our future. We'll, we'll, we'll have to deal with this and it's going to be now or never. We're, it's just, it's, it's almost, as depressing as it sounds, it's do or die. And currently we can do if we if we remain united and link all our different groups and problems and solutions. Yeah, thanks, Nehemiah. And that that's kind of one of the things I've been thinking about um, is this idea of like, uh, we only got this, or like, hey, we've only got this time. Let's do this. Like, let's do this. Uh, Bjorn. That was just a shout out to Nehemiah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, speaking of let's do this, uh, we've got on the call Steve Smith, the executive director of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. And uh, welcome. And he's going to tell us about some things that we can do. Um, so take it away. Well, thanks, Brian. And it sounds like y'all have had a wonderful session so far. So I'm, I'm not sure uh, how much I can add. It sounds like uh, y'all have been exposed to a, a lot of different things. Probably the, the best thing for me to do is just give you my coordinates on exactly how we fit into this and what we are prioritizing as an organization and then how we're sort of linking up with others, both uh, you know locally and globally. So the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy is a uh, nonprofit organization that does work throughout the Southeast United States. So Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida primarily although we also deal with some of the largest energy companies in the world. So Duke Energy, the Tennessee Valley Authority, Southern Company, Florida Power and Light. These entities spread across state lines, so they draw us into other states. Our 
focus as an organization is reducing the environmental footprint of how we produce and consume energy. And we're encouraging and moving folks forward to try to create uh, clean, safe, and uh, equitable communities that are working on uh, energy policy and environmentally related issues because the intersection. Um, personally, I'm a father and a grandfather. I gave up my veterinary practice to focus on this work uh, a number of years ago, have been at SACE um, and its predecessor since the early 1990s. Um, we, um, we have a set of program areas. Climate change is the um, driving narrative in all of our work, uh, trying to re reduce the carbon emissions. And we do that through uh, working on clean energy in the sense of trying to replace fossil fuels for electric generation with renewable energy generation. Um, we're very aggressive in pushing for energy efficiency because the greenest electron is the one you never use. Um, we have a big program in looking at electrifying uh, mobility and electrifying transportation. And then we have a, a set of things that we aren't too fond of. Uh, and we've been aggressive in working to shut down coal plants, uh, natural gas expansion, offshore drilling. And we are not uh, too enthusiastic about new nuclear power plants. And I can get into that if people want to. Um, the if I look at the environmental challenges facing humanity, the vast majority of them trace back to this fundamental premise. How do we produce and consume energy? You can climate change, you know, mountaintop removal, a lot of serious water challenge issues, a lot of the issues around uh, your radioactive material, um, uh, coal ash, uh, oil extraction, blah, blah, blah. I mean, just on and on and on. You can just keep coming back to how we produce and consume energy. What SACE does is we get up ahead of the process. We intervene in regulatory proceedings where these large energy companies are doing their long range planning. And we get in there and deconstruct their arguments and reconstruct arguments that favor more environmentally beneficial uh, resources. And the, the good news of that is we've been doing that for a number of years and now these cleaner technologies actually have the wind at their back economically and are actually beating a lot of the, uh, uh, the fossil um, counterweights that we get into these battles with. These utilities have a line to go to every single person's house. So everybody is impacted by this. And as you move closer to uh, you can see how your relationship with your local power company, whether it be Knoxville Utility Board, Lenore City's Utilities, whatever, those all are where a lot of this transaction happens. Um, the Tennessee Valley Authority is the primary wholesale provider to those 153 local power companies across the region. So for those of us, as we get lo more local, um, that's where a lot of the discussion happens is in relationship with TVA and with the local power companies, and then local governments trying to get local governments to actually set standards and goals. We've been working, I serve on uh, American Cannon's Climate uh, Council, and we've been working on strategies to uh, decrease the overall carbon footprint uh, for uh, not only Knoxville city government, but also for the uh, larger Knoxville community. And there are discussions happening in a number of other uh, urban areas about how to reduce that footprint. Um, so I am here to tell you that I'm optimistic, even though as you heard about the, the recent uh, data out of the Antarctic and the Arctic and all these things, we have got to bend the curve. Uh, I believe that we are making progress, but we're not making progress fast enough. We still do not have the national uh, sort of commitment of war footing that's necessary to really bend that curve at the level we need to. The Ukraine situation is both kind of a blessing and a curse because it's exposing. You know, the uh, sort of a re, uh, 
commitment to some technologies that are problematic. It says my internet's unstable. Am I, y'all hear me okay? Um, yeah, you uh, went off a bit, but right after you said Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it, the Ukrainian situation cuts, occurs, yeah. cuts both ways. Yes, unfortunately. Um, if I was to challenge uh, folks, I mean, there's lots of different groups. I think uh, uh, we shared with Brian a number of different groups besides ourselves that are doing good work in the region. You are part of the clean energy generation, whether you want to be or not, because this is an existential threat to the, the survival of our species. And our generation is being called to respond to this. Uh, and so we, we're asking everyone to be part of the solution and be part of the clean energy generation. And as you get, that's a double entendre. It's not only the people that are part of the clean energy generation, but it's also the technology. The good news is the technology is there if we apply it and we are aggressive in going after it. Um, we have got to electrify everything. So if you have anything in your home that uses fossil fuels, you should be getting rid of that. Uh, it's just that plain and simple, whether it's the gas stove, whether it's the gas lawnmower, whether it's whatever. Our whole goal is to electrify everything. And while we're moving to electrify everything, we're gonna decarbonize the electric power grid. And so uh, electric transportation, electric mobility is a huge part of that, but we have got to move forward um, to, um, to make that happen. So in your personal choices, that's probably, in my opinion, one of the most significant things you can do, obviously being civically engaged and putting pressure on electeds and our decision makers is a big piece of it. But if, in a personal way, if you can electrify everything, that's a big step in solving this problem. And then collectively, we've got to mobilize uh, more. So I could go on and on. I, I know we, this is a very tight window, so I will um, stop. I'm open to answering questions and, um, and, and anything that I said that needs clarification, I'm happy to dive into it. I just wanted to ask you, um, how you say you deal with these large corporate fuel companies, how do you um, interact? I mean, you seem to be a, quite a significant, substantial organization, but still on a national scale, these are centuries old industries. They have high political backing. How, how do you combat that? Like just this rooted, like they're very deeply rooted, especially in this area with the coal industry and this recent change to cleaner natural gas. How do you combat that? Well, um, there, there's, there's, a, there's a number of different ways. I, I think the, the good news is that the coal industry kind of dug their own grave, no pun intended, because um, they're going in there and parasitically pulling out uh, fossilized sunshine and spewing it on the planet. Uh, from cradle to grave, the coal industry is a devastating environmentally devastating industry and they have it caught up with them coal ash is choking out uh, a lot of these facilities uh, unfortunately or fortunately however you want to look at it uh, hydrological fracking basically came in and undercut the price for coal uh, so natural I don't even say natural gas is fossil gas um, fossil gas is actually now cheaper and so when we were building pressure on the air regulations and on the coal ash regulations, the, the fracking came in and knocked the props out economically. And coal is, is a dead industry walking. Uh, so as powerful as it was, it is, it is largely a dead industry walking. It, it's, its days are numbered. Now, fossil gas is a problem because most of the coal has been replaced by fossil gas, not all of it, but a lot of it. And uh, the gas infrastructure is, is robust and we're gonna continue to have to fight that fight. Uh, I don't believe the gas industry is as powerful as the coal industry as it was at one time, but it's not insignificant. The industry that we deal with is less the fuels themselves as much as the utilities that are uh, adopting the technologies to utilize those fuels. So if we can choke off 
TVA making the decision to build another gas plant, then that basically does not create the product demand for building more gas infrastructure. Uh, and unfortunately, TVA is still hell bent on build, replacing the Kingston plant uh, and their largest coal plant, Cumberland, with natural gas. And they're actually building pipelines out right now to actually do that. They claim the decision hasn't been made, but it effectively has been made. And that's why you know, people have got to mobilize against this. Um, so again, the utilities have everybody except for TVA in our region has to go before a state level regulatory agency. And that's where we intervene. And we basically challenge the utilities underlying assumptions about the economics. And that's where we've gained traction in having them get knocked out where they can't convince the regulators that a coal or a gas plant or a nuclear plant is the best option. We've had, we've had success there, uh, particularly in knocking coal plants out and in slowing down gas expansion and slowing down nuclear power expansion, but we have not been uh, totally successful and it's still a raging battle that goes on literally every single day. Thank you. Hey Steve, I, the house was supposed to consider a bill today that would limit uh, public, uh, local public oversight of fossil fuel infrastructure. I'm not sure how that vote uh, went, but I need to check it out. I'm probably passed. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this, this concept is called preemption. So a lot of what has been happening is we've been able to go in and other groups, not just us, there's a whole army of folks that are working on this, going into local governments and getting them to adopt progressive policies that try to limit natural gas expansion and do other things. The gas industry, because the state regulatory, I mean, the state legislatures in a lot of Southern states are tend to be more red and they tend to be under the sway of the fossil industry. So they pass state level regulation that preempts local governments being able to do something. And this is a huge problem all over the Southeast. And yes, the Tennessee legislature is on the verge of trying to preempt and will likely be successful. But they cannot preempt your decision not to buy gas, and they cannot preempt our voices from continuing to go forward to people like KUB and others and say, we want you to develop a 10-year exit plan to get out of expansion of natural gas and other things like that. So yes, we are going through a period of um, regressive uh, neo-troglodyte uh, thinking uh, down in Nashville. But uh, that will pass with time as the manifestations of climate, the climate challenge continue to intensify, but it doesn't prevent you from making the choices to go uh, all electric. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm gonna put a, a link to quite a few local organizations in the area that are doing work on climate and justice. And um, I hope you all get some time to check those out. I wanna give people some time to kind of do a little processing. I am a professor, so uh, I'm gonna give you guys some questions. I'm gonna drop them into the chat and uh, I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms so that you probably will be able to remember the questions one way or the other, but um, let me grab those. So the main, the main question um, is uh, so far, uh, what has stood out to you today? Um, and here are the questions. I'm going to put you in breakout rooms. We'll come back in about five minutes. Okay. We'll see here. Hey, uh, Brian, excellent work. I've got to jump. And okay. Uh, yeah, if you got to go. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah, Brian, it. Brian, thanks, thanks for the invite. Cleanenergy.org, anybody who wants to you know, stay in touch with us, um, really, really appreciate it. I don't know if Borg has a question, but you, you want to follow up or how do you want to do that? Um, yeah, I got Jordan, I can get you guys in, in touch, so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. That was great. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Okay, somehow it's just you and me. 
<laughs> thanks so much. That was great. So yeah, I, I, I actually just heard about that bill. And that's interesting that it kind of relates um, to your work. Um, one of the one of the things that that so my sister is from Bonnaroo and she presented and kind of uh, it's kind of interesting the, the the three of you and then my friend the artist. He's actually on a flight up to Alaska. Did you catch? You caught, I caught the, the tail end of his. Yeah, that sounds sounds great. Yeah, you, you check out, you know, sidekeener.com. Um, he he's so funny. We met as fresh. I was a freshman in college, and he was about to graduate. And he finished architecture school in 2008. Wow, not a good time to finish architecture school, <laughs> right, right? Right, right, right. So, but that, but interestingly, you know, I remember him calling me and being like. Ryan, I did everything right. I did everything they said to do. And now look at me. I'm having to go back to work construction again. Uh, yeah, yeah. And yet that kind of set him on this path. So yeah, like yeah, but, so yeah. it's great to me. I hope we run into each other. Um, well, thank I'll, you. I'll, yep. I'll be um, I'm in my office. I'm at Carson Newman. But okay. my mind, you know, I'm a, I've got a PhD in education and my mind is like similar to yours, like I love teaching, but I don't know if this is it. Right, right. For mitigating climate crisis. Yeah, yeah. No, so, it's just well. Any any way that I can help? If you've got other opportunities where I can do anything to you know share our work or anything, please don't hesitate. I really appreciate you thinking about us. And um, yeah, I I spoke out at Maryville College the other day, and you know we um, we try to you know stay connected. Some of our stuff is a little further down and then uh we have had um we've had graduate interns we have we it's been a while since i guess we've had undergraduate interns but you know folks who are really dedicated and want to really engage this stuff we want to i mean we've got to be bringing up new generation of of activists that are savvy and you know you get exposed to some of this stuff in school but you really don't get what you need until you get into the you know thick of it so if there's any uh stellar kids that you you've got coming through your program that you think might be interested you know think think about it you know i'm happy to help any way we can okay yeah awesome well, thanks right. again. thank you thanks i really enjoyed it. okay bye bye All right, hey everybody. Um, hope you had hope you had some good conversation there. Uh, any anybody want to share out? Brian, it was a little too short. <laughs> we just got acquainted. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's how it always goes for me in breakout room things we're like just getting started and then coming back sorry about that all right so the last thing that i've got a, a couple of last things um so there's a survey if you want to take it this uh the bard college has a a survey for participants. And that's the link that I just put in there. And then um, the one, one final thing that I wanted to share was a little bit of sources for inspiration um, and further education. Right now for inspiration, I'm turning to uh, a sick activist named Valerie Kaur. 
um, Gregory Boyle, who's a, a Jesuit minister, and Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, she's a, uh, a moss specialist, but she's an indigenous scientist. And her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, came out a few years ago, and I've been recommending it to everyone that will listen. Um, a few of the, the things I've been checking out in the lead up to this uh, Zoom was this project drawdown. They've got a whole kind of list of strategies and so on and things that we can do to work towards a, a just and a sustainable future. Um, so yeah, thanks again for coming. And uh, I hope I know most thanks of you. Thanks a lot, Brian. Things. That was great. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming.